So let's get started talking about proof-of-stake civil resistance. Now, the main purpose of proof-of-stake is a tool to achieve permissionless consensus. So remember, permissionless consensus, that's when you want a consensus protocol that has provable guarantees, consistency, liveness, etc. And you want that to be true even though at the time of the protocol's deployment, you have literally no idea who's going to be running the protocol, either now or far into the future. And just in case that sounds kind of crazy, let's notice that you know the most famous blockchain protocols out there, for example, Bitcoin and Ethereum, they are permissionless consensus protocols in this sense. You right now could pause this video and go start up, spin up a new node running either the Bitcoin or the Ethereum protocol. You would literally just download some software, wait for your computer to sort of sync up with the blockchain as it exists thus far, and then boom, your computer would be joining the party as one of the nodes uh, running that consensus protocol. Now, these days, you know, speaking at the beginning of 2023, we kind of take permissionless consensus for granted a little bit, right? We've had the Bitcoin protocol, for example, for 14 plus years or so. But again, I want to emphasize that, like, if those protocols didn't exist and I just said we want a consensus protocol with provable consistency and liveness and we want it to work no matter what set of nodes is running the protocol at any time in the future, uh, without these protocols existing, it's not a priori clear that that should even be possible. So it's kind of amazing that there is there are, in fact, permissionless consensus protocols. So given that the point of proof of stake civil resistance is to enable permissionless consensus, it makes sense to make sure that we have sort of freshly loaded in our mind um, all of the key challenges that arise in permissionless consensus. So you have two options. Um, one option is you can go back and rewatch the first video of lecture number nine, where we talk about permissionless consensus and its challenges is in some detail. Alternatively, you can watch the rest of this video, um, where we'll do a very brief review uh, of that video from lecture number nine, and I'll just use the same slides um, to page all of that context back in. So here then, um, for your review, is the first slide from lecture number nine. Uh, and remember, up until that point, so through lecture number eight, we were focusing entirely on permissioned consensus protocols. By permissioned, I mean that the set of nodes running the protocol were all known at the time of the protocol's deployment. The protocol is kind of born knowing the public keys um, of all of the nodes that are going to be uh, running that protocol. Within those safe confines of the permissioned setting, we uh, focus on two different styles of consensus protocols that are pretty different from each other. Uh, one of those being BFD type consensus protocols. That's exemplified um, by the Tendermint protocol, which was, of course, the main focus of lecture number seven. So those BFT type protocols, remember, they are the notes kind of, you know, just stay in constant coordination with each other. Right? Blocks are finalized kind of one at a time. To finalize a block, you need a lot of agreement among the nodes. Remember, we had sort of two stages of voting and you needed a supermajority of nodes to agree on each of those sort of stages, where by supermajority, I mean more than two thirds um, of the nodes running the protocol. And because those BFT type protocols are so conservative in finalizing blocks, um, as a result, you never have uh, any forks. So you never have sort of two blocks at the same block height um, claiming the same um, predecessor block, or at least, you know, under the standard assumption that more than two thirds of the nodes are running the protocol honestly and correctly, uh, you will never, in fact, uh, have any forks. And that's true even um, in the partially synchronous model, even under sort of network outages and, and, and network attacks. Meanwhile, in lecture number eight, we studied a very different style of consensus, namely longest chain consensus, right? And so here, actually, there's very little coordination among the nodes, right? So any node that's a leader of a round can just unilaterally propose whatever block it wants and name as that block's predecessor whatever it wants. And so given that the nodes have such sort of unilateral freedom to propose whatever blocks and predecessors they want, you have to be ready to deal with forks in protocol. You have to be ready to deal with two different nodes proposing blocks that have a common, uh, a common predecessor. And so, of course, in longest chain consensus, the way the, those forks are resolved in protocol is that only the longest chain counts. So the blocks that are considered finalized in longest chain consensus are the blocks on the longest chain. Or more specifically, blocks on the longest chain except for the last k blocks where k is some uh, security parameter. And so there are different trade-offs between those two styles of consensus, but for both of them, we proved a lot of sort of really cool consistency and liveness properties, sort of under various assumptions on the, the communication network and how many of the nodes are running the protocol honestly. So for the permission setting, we were really sort of quite happy uh, with those solutions. So in thinking about permissionless consensus, 
the first thing you should ask yourself is like, well, why don't our tried and true solutions for the permission case carry over immediately? Why don't they just immediately solve permissionless consensus? But if you think about it a little bit, you run into problems kind of right away once you start trying to think about running Tendermint from lecture number seven or permission longest chain consensus from lecture number eight. If you try to think about running those protocols in a permissionless setting. BFT type protocols, right? <laughs> some uh, An immediate challenge is, all right, so you're supposed to proceed by collecting super majorities of votes. Like if you have 100 nodes, then you want 67 votes before you sort of proceed to the next, to the next stage. But in the permissionless setting, like you don't know what N is. You don't know how many nodes are going to be running the protocol, which means you don't know how many votes you should be counting before you consider some block um, to be agreed upon. So that's the immediate challenge there. Without N, how do you do vote counting, which appears to be fundamental to those BFT type protocols. And longest chain consensus, meanwhile, the immediate problem that comes up is trying to figure out how to define the leader sequence. Remember, the way longest chain consensus works, it operates in rounds. Each round has a unique leader. Okay, that's one of the nodes running the protocol. And that is the node that gets to propose a block and a predecessor for that block unilaterally in that round. So how should those leaders be chosen? Well, in lecture number eight, we talked about two different strategies both of which seem just not really implementable in the permissionless setting. Strategy number one was just to have nodes take turns. Okay, so just literally a round robin order, deterministic, sort of repeating itself over and over again. Um, that would seem to require knowing who the nodes are uh, running the protocol. So it's not clear what round robin um, taking turns means in a permissionless setting. The other thing we studied at length in lecture number eight was you, was random leader selection, meaning you know if there are 100 nodes running the protocol, each round you know each node is equally likely 1% chance of being elected um, the leader of a given round, right? But again, right that 1% right you know the probability that a node is supposed to be selected is 1% because you know there's 100 nodes, and again if you don't know how many nodes there are, like how do you do uniformly random selection from the nodes when you don't even know like what the denominator of your probability is supposed to be? So those are the immediate obstacles that come up if you try to adapt uh, our permissioned protocols to the permissionless setting. Um, but we have seen at least one solution to those challenges back in lecture number nine when we talked about proof of work and Nakamoto consensus. The key insight we had at the beginning of lecture number nine is that we were missing one and really only one ingredient um, from turning our permissioned protocols into permissionless protocols, and that was some way of doing civil resistant random sampling. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's let's unpack that a little bit. So first of all, you know, what do I mean by randomly random sampling? I mean some black box, some procedure by which you randomly select one of the nodes running the protocol, and we sort of know why we want that, right? So it's it's especially obvious in longest chain consensus, right? Each round has a leader. Where does that leader come from? Well, if you had a black box that just sort of gave you random samples of nodes, you could just invoke that box um, once each round um, to get the leaders uh, of various rounds. BFT type consensus is similar, right? So if you remember how Tendermint works, um, each round does actually have a leader there as well. That's the node that makes the initial block proposal that other nodes are then going to be voting upon. So you'd want to use this random sampling procedure in exactly the same way there to select one node among those running the protocol to propose the block at the beginning of the round. There's also, you know, the nodes that are voting on the block. And so, you know, maybe you just have all nodes vote on the block or something like that. But, um, you know, probably you want to have a little more understanding of how many nodes are running the protocol. So you might want a committee of, let's say, 100 nodes. And then you could just invoke your random sampling box 100 times uh, and interpret the 100 results you get back as some sort of randomly selected committee of nodes that are going to be voting on the block proposal. So that's why we really want a random sampling procedure that basically gives us a, a way of reducing uh, permissionless consensus to permissioned consensus using the random sampling procedure to output the specific nodes that we're going to task with various responsibilities um, in the protocol. So, what, but what about this civil resistance property? And a related question is, you know, when I say sample a node, like from what probability distribution are we going to, going to be sampling from? Because maybe the most obvious answer, right, which would be the uniform distribution, each node equally likely to be selected. Um, as we've discussed, it's not clear how you would implement that in the permissionless setting when you have no idea um, how many nodes are running the protocol. Now, you could try to run an end around. Like you do something like, I don't know, ask nodes that are you know interested in participating to register in some way, like they submit 
their public key to the protocol saying like, hey, you know, give me a chance, you know, choose me once in a while, you know, as the output of your random sampling procedure. The issue there, of course, is it's very easy to then manipulate um, that procedure through sybils. So remember, a sybil attack is when one node masquerades as many. So it uses multiple identities, meaning it uses multiple public keys that all correspond to the same node, to the same entity. And the thing to remember in the permissionless setting, it's, it's basically free to carry out attacks of that form. Anybody can generate an unbounded number of public key, private key pairs very easily. Okay, so it's a real problem. You really need robustness to Sybil attacks. And if you just choose a registered public key uniformly at random, well, then an adversary could just register under a billion different public keys and guarantee that it's, it basically gets selected at, at every single round. Okay, and that would be, that would be a big problem. Right, so for example, it means that you could have an adversary that controls controls only one node, right? So maybe there's 99 honest nodes and, and one Byzantine node, but just by generating lots of identities, if you're just sampling uniformly at random from the identities you know about, even with just one node out of 100, an adversary might be able to totally screw up uh, your consensus protocol. This, of course, is, is much more challenging than the permission setting where we had the trusted setup, the PKI assumption, where there we just took it on faith, right? We left unjustified and just assumed that any two different public keys known to the protocol did, in fact, belong to two different nodes. In the permissionless setting, quite obviously, we cannot make that assumption. So that's why we really, really need a random sampling procedure, which is civil resistant. Um, meaning that the probability that a node gets selected is independent of the number of IDs that it might be using. Actually, more generally, we just want it to be um, impossible for a node to costlessly manipulate, either through the generation of a bunch of public keys or through any other method, to costlessly manipulate the probability with which it gets selected. Now, to be honest, we'd like a property that's even stronger than that, which is we'd like it to just literally be impossible. Okay, it doesn't, you know, costless, costly, whatever. We'd like it to just be impossible for nodes to manipulate the probability with which they're selected, which is a property that we sort of, our assumptions allowed us to have in the permissions plus PKI setting. Unfortunately, that seems like too much to ask for in the permissionless setting. So we'll settle on at least saying that, you know, the only way a node can manipulate the probability of selection is, is through incurring economic costs. That's what we're gonna mean by civil resistant. Again, a priori, not clear. There should exist civil resistant uh, mechanisms for random sampling of this type. Um, but you know, those of you that have watched lecture number nine, as you know, there is in fact a solution. We've already seen one, uh, which was proof of work. So the idea of proof of work, remember, is to sample a node with probability proportional uh, to its computational power. Okay, but like how would a protocol do that? It has no idea what the computational power is of the different nodes. And so the clever solution there is to not do the random sampling like top down, like the protocol doesn't directly do the sampling itself, but rather the random sampling is carried out bottom up by the nodes themselves. Right, so nodes are just going to be trying to solve these hard crypto puzzles uh, under the random oracle assumption we talked about back in lecture number nine. Basically, all they can do is just sort of repeatedly guess nonces, you know, hoping to get something that hashes to a number that's um, sufficiently close to zero. Um, and what that means is that the likelihood that any given node is going to be the first one to solve a crypto puzzle and therefore the leader of the next round, that's just going to be proportional um, to their hash rate, to the number of guesses um, that they're able to attempt um, in producing a solution to one of these hard crypto puzzles. So this particular random sampling procedure where the output of the procedure is just whatever node is the first one to solve the, the current crypto puzzle, um, that procedure is civil resistance, right? And that's because um, the probability a node gets selected depends only on its hash rate, independent of how many IDs that hash rate might be spread over. Okay, so that's why it gives us the desired civil resistance property. And in lecture number nine, we saw how to pair proof of work random sampling um, with longest chain consensus to extend all of the guarantees we proved for permissioned longest chain consensus uh, in lecture number eight to the permissionless setting. And remember this particular pairing of longest chain consensus with proof of work civil resistance, uh, that's often called Nakamoto consensus. And in fact, you generally only see, for the most part, proof of work coupled with longest chain consensus protocols. You don't usually see it paired with a BFT type protocol. And we had a video on lecture nine that explained why. Basically, if you try to do that, you inevitably run into pretty serious liveness issues uh, with your protocol. 
So that's what we saw in lecture number nine. That's sort of the first permissionless consensus protocol that we saw, Nakamoto consensus based on uh, proof of work. And the point of this lecture, lecture 12, is to talk about an alternative to proof of work, which has some advantages over proof of work and some disadvantages, as we'll discuss at length uh, later. But this alternative is known as proof of stake. At a high level, the idea of proof of stake is to randomly sample nodes with probability proportional not to their computational power, but rather to their economic commitment uh, to the protocol. What do I mean economic commitment? You know, for example, you know, maybe nodes have um, put in escrow uh, some amount of native cryptocurrency, so currency native to the blockchain protocol. Maybe they've put some of that in escrow into a designated smart contract. That would be an economic commitment. And you would like to sample then a node with probably proportional to the size of their economic commitment. That's what proof of stake is all about. Now, in contrast to proof of work, which we saw kind of works really elegantly in conjunction with longest chain consensus and really doesn't work very well with BFT type protocols, proof of stake civil resistance can actually be used with either type of consensus protocol. As the years have gone by, it's become more and more common to see proof of stake coupled with BFT type protocols, and we'll talk some about them, but you can also pair it with longest chain protocols, and that's been done successfully um, in major blockchain protocols, and we'll talk about that as well toward the end of uh, lecture 12. Now let me remind you, proof of work and proof of stake are not the only approaches to civil resistance possible. Uh, there are others. They are the two by far most dominant approaches in deployed protocols, and those are the two accordingly that we're focusing on uh, in this lecture series. So while proof of work is really kind of the original approach to civil resistant random sampling, right, that's sort of introduced as part of the Bitcoin protocol, uh, in recent years, to be honest, proof of stake has really occupied a more and more dominant position uh, as far as how major blockchain protocols approach um, civil resistance. Perhaps, you know, most um, vividly exemplified by Ethereum's switch from proof of work to proof of stake, and I believe it was August uh, of 2022. And beyond Ethereum, you know, if you look at just like the last four years, so like the years like 2019 to 2022 or so, a uh, few, if any, major new proof of work blockchain protocols were launched um, during that period, whereas several major proof of stake blockchain protocols have launched uh, over that time period. You know, some have been more successful than others, but, but multiple quite serious and some quite successful proof of stake projects um, have come in out over the last few years. So I hope that sounds pretty exciting, right? Proof of stake, right? The currently central approach to the crucial problem of civil resistance that really any permissionless consensus protocol uh, must somehow solve. So how does it work? We'll start talking about that in the next video. I'll see you there.